with you guys this morning, excited about this new series we're starting. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We are going to spend the next three weeks looking at what's historically been called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's a, a sermon that was Jesus gave to his disciples very early on, and what we see is that these are the, the principles in which Christianity is going to be based on. This is what Jesus is going to continue to preach. He's going to preach similar series or similar messages like this. Later on, we see a similar message that Luke re, uh, records. Uh, that is very similar to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, but not exactly the same. And, and, and so this is just, just as a, a, a foundational piece, a cornerstone on which the church is supposed to be built. The, this way of thinking, this way of doing. And, uh, and so we're going to spend some time talking about it. And what we're going to find is, is that it, it's really just so... Uh, juxtaposed to, the, to everything that society is teaching us, everything that culture is telling us about life and about love and about, I mean, just all the ways that we do things is so radically different that the only way to explain the kingdom of God is that it's the upside down kingdom of God. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense in light of everything that we've heard. We're even going to hear that. Uh, there's a number of uh, the statements that Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 5 where he says, you've heard it said or, or, or you've been told. And how many of us live our lives? I mean, we've been, we've been told by this culture. We've been told by our society, by our, our families of origin. This is how you do things. Maybe with words or maybe it's just, I mean, just unspoken realities. But this is how you do things. This is how our family does things. These are the things that we're about. Versus when this is what I say in the very words of Jesus. You know, it's just like the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord. I mean, these were the important things uh, that Jesus wanted us to understand. And we're going to spend some time looking at them this morning. Uh, I, I came across this uh, quote uh, a number of years ago, and, and it just kind of stuck with me, but it's this. Well-behaved women seldom make history. Well-behaved women seldom make history. And now you think about, like, what kind of woman would say this, right? Is it, a, is it Marilyn Monroe? Could we, t we totally could see Marilyn Monroe saying this, right? Well-behaved women rarely make history. What about someone like Eleanor Roosevelt? Does that sound something like Eleanor Roosevelt? Very stately. I mean, like, she was just such a pillar, uh, for not only for her family, for the Roosevelts, uh, but for women of her day. In 1976, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich penned these words in an article that she wrote called... Um, Virtuous Women Found, the New England Ministerial Lecture. And that what she did was she went back and she looked at the lives of the women of the church from 1668 to 1735. And this is what she found, uh, writings about them. Cotton Mather, uh, she says, called them the hidden ones. They never preached or sat on the deacon's bench, nor did they vote or attend Harvard. Neither because they were, uh, neither because they were virtuous women, they didn't, they did, blah. Sugar's wearing off here. Having a little bit of trouble. Neither, because they were virtuous women, did they question God or the magistrates. They prayed secretly, read through the Bible at least once a year. They went to hear the minister preach even when it snowed. Man, what would I do for people who would come to preach, hear me preach when it was sunny outside? Um, they came, they preached whenever it snowed. Hoping for an eternal crown, they never asked to be remembered on earth. And they haven't been. Well-behaved women seldom make history. Yet these pious matrons had little chance at all, it said. These hidden ones didn't leave behind chapters in history books, but they left behind families impacted by their faithfulness and their love. And what we don't, we don't need more people who want to make history. The church needs more Christians who want to change history. Jesus, uh, Jesus followers who are tired of the status quo in their daily lives, those who desire to be totally sold out for Jesus, those who choose to live to bring about the kingdom of God in everything that they do. We may not make history, but that was never the point anyways. What we're after is to be people who change history. And that's what we're going to find. The, the life that Jesus calls us to in the Sermon on the Mount is about changing our history. 
When it comes to living out our faith today, we've got to have the boldness and the, to challenge the status quo, this status, the status quo that tells us it's about work and money and life and repeat. And, you know, you do the same things over and over and over again. We never challenge the status quo. We're, we're never there to courage or we don't have the courage to forge these, these new adventures. When you think about people like Amelia Earhart, Amelia Earhart died trying to circumnavigate the globe in the 1930s. That She was forging new adventures. She was challenging the status quo. This was not something that women did. What about Edmund Hillary, the first person to reach the summit of Mount Everest? It's like 29,000 feet. I mean, you think about these, these kind of adventurers. People like those, they loved adventure, and they shook off the status quo to reach new heights and to set new records. And history remembers these kinds of people, either for their victories or their defeats, but at least they've tried. So many of us have sunk into routines and rhythms of life that keep us in this rat race just like everyone else. Just like well-behaved Christi- or people rarely make history. Christians who don't understand the way of the kingdom of God are not going to change history. It's not going to get any better from here on out. This morning, I want to ask a question for our question of the day. And this is just a time we take a couple moments, answer this, uh, this question, closest people to you. But this is a pretty deep one. Why don't we live lives that change the world? Why don't we live lives that change the world? To the people closest to you, we're going to get right back together and jump into Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. So go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 1. It says this, On that day he saw the crowds gathering. Jesus went up on the mountainside, sat down, his disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach. And this is what he said, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice or for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And we hear a passage like this, and we look at each of these beatitudes, and from time to time, we think it's a list that we get to pick and choose from. Like, you know, I'm feeling like I'm a, uh, you know, I want to be pure in heart, or I really want to hunger and thirst for righteousness, or maybe it's like, these are things I will never be, but I'm going to try and be one. And the reality is that these are describe this list describes the character of a Christian the whole list this is something that we're striving to be and when you look at this list at first thought um, it look doesn't look like a list that changes the world it looks like a pretty impact list list people that aren't uh, aren't challenging the status quo but when everybody else is living like the world for Christians to rise up and to live like this. We are going to live transformed lives. Lives are the ones uh, that Jesus has sent out to impact the world. And we're evidence of people living out this type of list. 2,000 years ago, if Christianity hadn't been lived out by people, by generation after generation, Christianity would have never reached us. But here we are. And there's future generations that are depending on us. These Beatitudes call us to a, a different lifestyle. Everyone else is out there chasing money and possessions and power. And when you do, you're just following somebody along. You're just the next person in line in a long line of people that are just trying to get after the same exact thing. We're just conforming to the world. It's not wrong to have money. It's not ni- wrong to have nice things. It's not wrong for, to have influence. But it's wrong to make this the main thing of our lives. Christ, our Christians follow Christ, not the crowd. These Beatitudes confront our cultural, societal values of independence, strength, arrogance, and even accomplishment. These things, they call us to a completely, day, or a completely different way of life. These are the ways that God wants to change the world. This is what makes it so upside down. There, there's nobody else out there that's saying that calling us to this type of life. 
As Jesus continues to teach into verse 13, he talks about two really guiding principles when he, when he, what he calls us and challenges us to be. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is your salt if it's lost its flavor? Can it be made salty again? It will be thrown out and be trampled underfoot as worthless. And, and what I was, I was reading about this salt is salt is preservation. It's purification for a culture that didn't have refrigeration that's what they use salt for, for preservation and for purification. And, and for us Christians, Christ, our responsibility is a preservation of morality, living out God's way of life. It's our responsibility to live out justice, a concern for the most vulnerable, for the poor and the marginalized members of our society, even going as far as making long-term personal sacrifices in order to serve the interests and the needs and the causes of others, living this generous life for others. It's even our responsibility to be uh, preserving social consciousness, the concern for the problems of this world. This is why we're here. When we look at the church, what we see is a history of all of these things, of of staying on top of preserving morality and justice and social consciousness. I remember hearing an atheist uh, and agnostic talk about having just wanted to remove Christianity from the world. Okay, well, that's fine, but where do we start and where do we end? Do we start with the church? Okay, we take... The church, but where do we end? Because so many of our hospitals, our schools, our orphanages, our feeding programs, all child labor laws, even abolition of slavery, all came out of the church. And if we begin to shut down church programs, there's not going to be anything left to take care of those that the world wants nobody to deal, wants nothing to do with. We created these systems because of our love for Jesus Christ. We are the salt of the earth. And I was reading that it's virtually impossible for sodium chloride, the two particles of salt, to, to lose its flavor. It's just chemically impossible. And what, what Jesus is saying when he says, uh, when he asks us if we've lost, uh, can salt be made salty again? It's because it's become defiled. And what they would do is these peddlers would go down to the Dead Sea and they'd get a little bit of salt, the saltiest place on earth. They'd get get the salt and they'd mix it with dirt. And you couldn't even tell the difference, right? I mean, what's a salt crystal and a dirt crystal? The difference, right? But it would have lost its saltiness because there was no salt in it. It was totally defiled. And so for us Christians, when we have these responsibilities, if we're not living them out, if we're not making them a part of who we are, then we have become defiled, We've lost our saltiness. Jesus continues on when he says the light. He says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, the lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Jesus says that our light represents good deeds we do as Christians. We're supposed to be always looking for opportunities to do good wherever we have the chance. Every Christian is called to move into the world and live such distinctly different or upside down, upside down lives that those who don't know God catch a glimpse of him through your life through your deeds, through your saltiness, they catch a glimpse of God's loving kindness, of his mercy, of his grace, of his goodness. By the way that you live your life, they can see God. In verses 17 through 20, uh, Jesus is talking about the law I'm not going to read through those passages, but he's talking about how Jesus, how he came to fulfill the law and how the law can't be understood apart from him. Everything that we understand about the Old Testament law, all the rules, all the details are there as a foreshadow of who Jesus would be and how he would lead his people. And so when we look to the Old Testament, we look through the lens of who Jesus is. As we work through the rest of chapter 5, we're going to see is is that Jesus isn't after just this this knowledge-based morality. It's not just that we we do good because that's what we're supposed to do. He's he's after our hearts. And And he begins to say things like, you've heard it said, but I say. And the you've heard it said, they're all heart or mind-based things. You've heard it said, you don't murder somebody. Well, yeah, of course you don't murder somebody. That's just wrong. But, But where does murder start? This is start in our heads. It's like we wake up and it's a good day to kill somebody, you know. 
starts in our hearts. We've let, we've, we've let that grow inside of our hearts. And so Jesus says, um, he said, you've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, if you're even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call somebody an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the courts. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. And it's funny because the commentator was like, well, let me just clarify a couple of things here. There are dumb people in the world. <laughs> This is not what he's talking about. This is baseless, anger-based, just throwing out, uh, just, you know, just word vomiting out against people. But he says, even if you are angry with someone, he says, you are subject to judgment. Why? Because anger is the seed of murderous uh, emotions in our heart. If Jesus is after our heart, he doesn't want anything in there to go back to the salt to defile our heart. And if we allow our hearts to be angry and we allow them to be bitter, action comes out of the heart. And so he wants to clean our hearts out. And he starts with this idea that the seeds of murderous emotions start in the heart. So don't even allow yourself to be angry with people. Sure, people make us mad. Sure, things they do things that irritate us. And, and we could get mad. But anger is when we sit and we stew on it. And we let those negative thoughts and emotions just overrun us again and again and again. On and on and on. And that's when we begin to lash out and we begin to act out. But Jesus is saying, don't even let it get that far. Don't, don't let it. Don't let it seep into the heart. Into verse 27 and 28, he says, You've heard the commandment say you must not commit adultery, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with, with lust has already committed adultery with them in his heart. Why is Jesus talking about adultery? Adultery breaks down marriage. It breaks the faithfulness that a married couple vowed to each other. Because marriage is this sacred institution that uh, is a unity between Jesus or between the husband and the wife. And Jesus knows that that affairs don't just happen. It's just like we wake up one day like we're going to murder somebody. Like, hey, I'm just going to go out and have an affair today. No, it starts in the heart. And that's because we've allowed lust to come inside and and wreck and havoc on our hearts and wreck havoc on our lives. Jesus says, or Jesus knows that they don't happen, uh, that, that affairs just don't happen, but it's because we fanned the flames of fantasy. And a glance, though, is... Glance is, Jesus isn't talking about the glance. He's talking about the ongoing thought, the continuing to think about what we've saw. We live in such a a sexualized world that when it comes to seeing someone that catches our eyes, the same way we see something as beautiful as a mountain or seashore or a flower, we just have to notice it and move on versus allowing ourselves to dig deeper and deeper into it because that's the lust and that rust takes heart or takes root in our heart And once it's in our heart, it becomes action, and we do something about it. It's an interesting set of verses that Jesus proceeds with in 29 through 30. When he says this, So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one body part than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your strong hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one body part than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. And Jesus is using this hyperbole here to teach us and talk to us about the seriousness of getting rid of whatever is causing us to sin in our life. Get rid of it because it's better to go into heaven maimed than it is to go into hell with our whole bodies. And while he's not talking about our physical eyes or our physical hands, um, it may be a relationship. It may be going to the water cooler at a certain time of day. It may be having a free access to the internet where no one can see. And there's no accountability there. Whatever it is, whatever we've allowed to take root in the past, we've got to just dig it out. We've got to get rid of it so that our hearts can be cleaned. So we can live the life that he's called us to live. As we go on into 31 and 32, I'm, I'm going to take um, just some time to tread lightly here. I, I don't, we're not, this isn't about offense. This is totally not about judgment. But this is about what God has to say. He says, you've heard it said that a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. 
But what I say is the man who divorces his wife, unless she's been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Why is Jesus talking about divorce? Again, marriage is the building blocks that God has built society. It's the relationship in which he uses to explain the relationship between Jesus and his church. If he is the groom and we are the bride. And if we can just willy-nilly break apart marriages... How can we sustain as a church, as a movement? Marriage is about a commitment and faithfulness before God and each other. God is a God of reconciliation. So many of our marriages break apart because people have drifted, because they've not focused on the marriage. They've not worked on it. They've gone off and done their thing, whether it's work or, or maybe focusing on the children. But they, they've gone off and they've separated mentally and emotionally, and that leads into divorce. But if God is a God of reconciliation, when we can't reconcile a relationship, what does, that what does that say about our understanding of God and the relationship that we have and the great lengths at which he went to reconcile himself to us? Now hear me out. We're not talking about tolerating any type of abuse, emotional, physical abuse of any kind. There are definitely reasons to get out of a bad marriage, and, and God understands that. But this, just this society where we easily break apart these marriages because we don't want to be committed or we don't want to be uh, steadfast in those relationships, that is what God hates. Even Malachi 2 9 says that, that God hates divorce. He hates it, it's something that He hates. But because of the hardness of man's heart and our personal brokenness, God grants us grace and mercy, and this grace and this mercy extends far, far out into the, every corner of our lives. But, it, but, it's, but it's building our, our life on the, the rules and the, and the laws that God has made. The very words of Jesus here. 38 through 42, Jesus says, You've heard it say that the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say don't resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other. If you're sued in court or your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away any of those who want to borrow. And this Old Testament principle that Jesus is talking about, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, was a, a system of, of judgment. Because the Old Testament wasn't just a, a religious system. It wasn't just about morality, but it was the societal rules. I mean, there were rules for how the society would function together. And so this eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, was that equal justice was brought for all punishment. And there are consequences for actual laws here. But the problem is, is that it turned into a vehicle for retaliation. I mean, that's the way we even only, the way we understand this passage when we think about it. Is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's, it's about re retaliation. But how can we Christians be about retaliation, retaliating against somebody who's done something to us? Bloomberg sheds light on this perspective when he says, not only should Christians reject all behavior motivated only by a desire for retaliation, but we must also po be positive. We also must positively for the good of those with who, with who we would otherwise be at odds with. There's a part of us that has to get rid of all of this anger, all of this bitterness, all of this rage inside of us that would cause us to want to retaliate against somebody. Because this is not the way of the kingdom of God. This is not the way that we've been called to live. This is not what makes up the church the way it's supposed to be. Jesus ends Matthew chapter 5. With these words, starting in verse 43, you've heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of God, or true children of our Father in heaven. For he gives sunlight to both evil and good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love others, only those who love you, what reward would there be for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. Track with me here. 
if we're looking at all the things that we've talked about and we see this way that we've been called to live differently, these aren't just some old, tired rules of ancient civilization, but concepts that have the power to change societies for the better. This problem is that sin in our life, because of that sin, we lean towards selfishness and how we want to live rather than what's better for those around us. The power, or the problem uh, is that each time we choose to live in these ways of the world, we chip at the foundations of society that we built on. I mean, just look at the world around us and we can see that this is a pretty shaky foundation. You, you know, this week we were all shocked as a m- number of our uh, congressmen and, and their staff were uh, targeted at a baseball p- you know, park at 7 o'clock in the morning. They had no way to protect themselves. And why did the guy go and, and shoot, out, uh, shoot up a baseball field? Because ideology rose above personhood. Ideology became more important than humanity. Because down in his heart, he let the seeds of anger grow and grow and grow until all he could do was lash out in anger. The body of believers in Jesus Christ that make up his church must integrate these ways into their life. This is what we do. These aren't just suggestions, but a lifestyle to adapt. Peter reminds the church this in 1 Peter chapter 2 when he says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. Now for the church, these are important words because it tells us who we are and where we're from. When we become Christians, when we decide to follow Jesus, our identity is no longer found in this place that we call home, where we plant our feet. We're no longer Americans or even citizens of this world, but we are temporary residents and foreigners. For our home country is God's country. And it says, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from the worldly desires that wage against your very souls. That I've, you've heard it said is what's waging against our very souls. But we chose Jesus. And because we chose Jesus, we choose to live differently for the kingdom of God. That's what we've chosen. We've chosen to live differently for the kingdom of God. That's what even Jesus says in verse 47 and 48. He says, if you're only kind to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? How are you different from anyone else? But um, He says, how are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. But you are to be perfect or complete, or mature, not perfection because we've got all the right things done, or we never sin, but we're complete, that we're, that we're uh, mature in our faith. If Jesus, or, yeah, if Jesus is the pinnacle of all action, all knowledge, all li- ways of living, we are to be striving to live like that, to be more complete, and to be more mature in our lives. But how are we living differently What can others see in our lives that makes it different from what they see in the lives of everyone else? I'm not talking about being some elitist jerk that's pointing out how I'm better than you are. But out there going out and living out our faith every single day. Someone who loves Jesus so much that they're trying to live differently no matter what the culture around us is saying. No matter what the culture is telling us. What kind of pressure it's putting on us at work or at home or in our neighborhoods. Why do we want to live differently? Why would we choose to live differently? Because we want to be like Jesus. We want to be complete. We want to be mature in this life. This is what we're trying to achieve. He's the one who embodied all of these ways. He's the one who lived so differently that they killed him for it. They didn't understand him. The truth of the matter is they probably won't understand us. But we're not living for the approval of this world. We're not living for the approval, pats on the back from the people around us. We are living for Jesus. And what the world needs right now are not more people who are conforming to the status quo, but those who are willing to live for something greater than themselves. 
What this world needs is the kingdom of God and to know the creator who created them. We choose to live differently for the kingdom of God. That's who we are. Back in 1997, uh, Apple Computers did a... um, an advertising campaign. They were coming out of a terrible slump that company had been run into the ground and they had finally brought back um, their original founder and creator and they were looking for a way to get the word out that Apple was different. And IBM had just uh, launched a, um, a new campaign called Think and that was their thing. They introduced their think pads, 1997. The laptops were becoming new. And, um, and so, at, so an ad agency uh, challenged uh, Apple with this ad called Think Different. And I'm an Apple geek, so, like, I mean, it, it's just fun for me to do these things uh, or, to, you know, to, to, be, uh, to go back to Apple history. I, never mind. Anyways... <laughs> But, but there's something about this video, beyond just that I like their computers, that I like their products, uh, there's something about this video that inspires me, some, something that challenges me. And, and it's not because I think that their products are going to change the world, not because I think that they're the greatest things since sliced bread, um, but, but it challenges me, especially when I look at it through the lens of Christianity, I mean, because that's all we've been talking about this morning is to think different. If this is the way the world thinks, then we want to think different. That's who we want to be. That's what we're we're all about. But but this video, it challenges and and it inspires, especially when we look at it through the lens of what it means to be a Christian. Go ahead and, and roll that video. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and sore holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things, they push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. A modern mantra, tell me that these are the words that don't define Christianity, uh, vilified, square pegs and round holes, those that have the challenge, the status quo, and everything around them. I mean, this is, this is who we are wrapped up in modern language. This is the, the challenge of the Bible. If Jesus could put together an ad agency today to inspire the world would he have used verbiage like that? And I think he would. I think he would have challenged us in the same exact ways. This is who you are to be. There's a whole world around you that's telling you to be one way, but the reality is, is that we want to think differently. We want to be differently. We've, we've been changed from the inside out. Our hearts have been changed from what they once were to, to what they are now. And we have this amazing, amazing opportunity to walk with Jesus right now. Now, he's given us this, this, this life, this joy, this adventure that we're on. And these passages from Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6 and 7, they challenge us and inspire us to live differently. But the only way that you can think about it is, is to think that it's upside down. It doesn't make any sense. And that's okay because... We don't want to make sense. We want to see our our creator face to face one day. We've got to be willing to do whatever he says. We've got to be willing to go to whatever lengths he challenges and calls us to in faith to find him there. When we partake of communion, we take of these emblems, that's what, what we're reminded of. We're reminded of the fact that Jesus or God didn't allow his anger to burn in his heart against us. That because of our sinfulness and the way of our waywardness, the way we walked away from him, 
He had every right to leave us right where we are in our pitiful, broken state. But he loved us so much more than that, that he showed us what true reconciliation is, that he would go to such great lengths to send his own son down to die for our sins, that we could get to spend eternity with him if all we did was believe. And when we take these emblems, we're, we're remember, we were, are reminded of that. The broken bread reminds us that his body was broken. The, the cup of the juice reminds us that his blood was shed. That he went to reconcile us and him through the love of Jesus Christ, through his earthly ministry, and now ascended to the right hand, the throne of the kingdom of God. That's what we remember when we partake of this communion, a worldwide body of believers who are out there changing everything and challenging everything that we see here on earth. That's why we do what we do. Because Jesus came and he did it first and he loved us so much that he calls us to be with him to do the same thing. This morning we're going to uh, collect an offering and in the baskets, or whether you give with cash or credit or you uh, go online and give online or you give through our text to giving program, uh, you can find information about that in the, in the bulletin itself. But, but when we collect this offering, it's because we want to be change agents. We want to see what we can do when we pull all of our resources together and watch God multiply them in the lives of the people around us. Some of the monies that we use, uh, that we collect, go to support uh, different missions. This week, uh, Matt and I and Malcolm were headed to uh, the camp out in Keystone Heights with our middle schoolers. We're going to spend a week with middle schoolers, uh, loving on them and, and sharing the good news. Uh, but those funds go to support this amazing camp that's, that's changing lives of kids year after year after year. Some of the funds that we uh, collect create scholarships for kids that, that need help get into camp. And we want to make sure that every kid has an opportunity to go to camp regardless uh, of, you know, just what they can afford or can't afford. So we, we pull aside funds each year to go into the scholarship fund just for them to, to do that. And the amazing thing is, is that we see life change year after year after year. And, and the kids that have already gone to camp, we've already had uh, some of our kids go off to camp. And, and one's already made a decision for Christ is going to be baptized next Sunday. And, uh, and this is exciting stuff that we get to participate in. And our, our resources go to make sure that the, the lives are being changed and impacted in an amazing place like North Florida Christian Service Camp. This morning is an opportunity for you to respond. It's, it's a time that we set aside because we, we know that, that God wants to speak to us. And that when we gather together like this and we remember him in worship and we proclaim his word and we take communion together, we know that God is speaking to us and he wants us to join him in, in this mission that he's called us on and this life that he's called us to. And so in these moments are moments that we get to respond. Either respond to Jesus for the very first time because we've, we've never accepted Christ our Lord and our Savior. and We want to we join him. We want to be baptized. We want our sins forgiven. And so we're baptized, or whether we come to partner with Homeport, say this is the church that I want to be on mission with, that I love and want to make my home, or whether you need to just respond right where you are and just thank God for everything that he's doing in your life and answer the challenges of this life. Maybe you saw a beatitude that you're struggling with, and God's sitting there reminding you right now, hey, let's work on this this week. Or maybe you've let that anger and that bitterness inside of you for too long and it's just festered and it's stewed and it's rooted and it's growing this big, ugly bush in your life that you need to get rid of. And God's saying, Let, let's take care of that. Let me help you with that. However you need to respond to God this morning, know that, that he is right there wanting you to respond and, and is willing to help you with anything that you are because of the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives. Thank you.